So should we maybe start with the questions in the chat or? Maybe I'll ask first because yeah. I have a more general question about the, um, so you showed some of these results, how certain like the load um, behaves, but I, could you give some more details of the underlying um, methodology or equations or system of equations that determines the behavior? Mm -hmm. You said you, you had one simpler model first and then you said you augmented that model or you extended that model with data. And I was a bit more curious about what is behind, so what determines this dynamics? I couldn't mm -hmm. quite understand that. Um, yeah, uh, I don't I don't have um, differential equations that determine the system, but I do um, agent-based simulations. Uh, I can tell you more about that, that's a problem. Um, so maybe I will just really present that slide right now, one by one, and then in the end, we'll see whether that answers your, your question. Um, so there is a basic loop underlying um, that I've already tried to tell you about. At first, we calculate when requests appear, they are Poisson distributed and we choose them randomly. Um, so this is like, like a Monte Carlo simulation. Um, and then we, we assign um, the request that we have calculated to the bus that fits best. Then we perform scheduled stops, so the uh, scheduled events, so the transporters drive, um, the, the stops that are on their job, job list um, are performed. Oh, actually, one question on first yeah. one. This uh, request, is that a random number generator or how do you, so how do you get to a starting point? What are the requests? Um, with red, yeah. yeah, with a random number generator. So, um, so for the simulations without the data, yes. Um, we first um, choose randomly uh, Poisson distributed travel time uh, or request time when the request appears. Um, but actually we choose the delta t um, from the last request to the next request. Um, and then we choose randomly uh, where the origin and the destination will be. And this differs. So um, the uh, simulations that I've shown you in the beginning, they are in a Euclidean space. So this is a um, periodic square or a square with peri periodic boundaries. And the requests are really just randomly distributed in that square. So people can go from anywhere to anywhere. Um, the only condition that we have is that the destination has to be inside a circle around the origin. That is so we don't prefer diagonals. If we wouldn't do that, then diagonal directions would be more likely um, than other directions, and we don't want this to be. So we choose an origin randomly, and then we choose a destination randomly that has to lie inside the circle. So we simply have a loop. Um, mm -hmm. If it's not inside the circle, then we just randomly choose one again. Um, for we, we have also different distributions. So we have also um, tried centers, for example, then it's more likely that we choose origins in the center of the unit square. Um, we have also done simulations on a grid or on other randomly generated networks. And the further, uh, furthest step is what I've shown you using the requests on the Manhattan grid. Um, then they are not um, randomly generated, but we use the data. Sorry. Okay. It's good that you ask these questions for me. This is yeah, it was clear. Just like, <laughs> yeah, for, for me, it is, but I, I deal with this since three years. So please ask questions. Okay, so we have these requests, we assign them to buses, and then we perform scheduled events. And if you're interested, I can also tell you how this assignment algorithm works right now. But if the uh, question sure. is more, yeah? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think that would help with. Okay, so um, let's assume we have the black requests have already been posed and they have been assigned to the buses. So we have some jobs that are already in a queue. Um, and now the new gray request appears. Then we will check for each bus. And for each planned stop in the bus, uh, for, for the bus, whether the stop fits after this certain stop. So we will check whether after the first stop, it would fit to insert the stop after the second, after the third, and so on. And we will now take this one with the shortest detour. So we will take the first option. And now we will do the same for the second bus. Uh, uh, oh no, uh, first we do the same for the, we do the same for the uh, destination. So uh, the shortest detour for the destination would now be this. And you can already see that the new route for this bus would not be optimal. So we do the same for the second bus. There we would choose uh, this option for the um, origin. And this option is not so nice for the destination. Oh, this, this looks better. 
So we would replace the purple route um, by this slight detour and could then serve the, the passenger. So um, we would now decide that the purple bus will, um, will serve the user and the blue bus will just keep the original route length. Can I can I interject here? Yeah. Okay. So you do this for each bus. So if you have a lot of buses, even if one bus is at the opposite side of yeah. town, you would have to your algorithm would check if tech like there's no cutoff distance that you perform around each bus. Or so this is a very simple algorithm. As I've already told you, there is operations research where people try to have a very efficient algorithm mm. that works good and so on, but we don't want to lose any solutions. So it might be good that a bus that is completely at the other side at the moment serves uh, this user because there are already stops planned that will like lead the bus close to this, to this new user. So we, we really check each bus. This makes our algorithm, of course, slow, but um, more precise in that direction. There are other things um, that we completely ignore in this simple algorithm. For example, users usually want to have a maximum detour. So people would not accept that they have to wait for two hours for their bus. Of course not. <laughs> so realistic algorithms have to have some time windows where you say, okay, if uh, for this bus, the solution would take two hours for the user, then we will neglect the solution and check for a better one. And they will also reject users. If they don't find a solution that is uh, feasible, then they will just tell the user, okay, our service cannot um, transport you. If you have a real service like the pilot projects that are running in Germany at the moment, where you have eight buses in a the city, then you have to reject a lot of users that do not fit to your routes. But then you also do some kind of cherry picking because you only keep those users in the system that fit very good to the routes that you already go, that have a very small detour. And then it becomes a bit unrealistic. So we try to avoid all these things. And um, in some, depending on the parameter settings, I have really unrealistic travel times. So sometimes the users have to travel two hours. Of course, they wouldn't do that. But that's not the point that I want to focus on. So I really um, ignore these influences and ignore the personal preferences that might hinder such cases um, to then compare how it, things develop, how the travel time changes or how the relative route length changes. Um, so this is really, really simple algorithm. Okay. But maybe that yeah, made things a bit clearer. So thank you for the questions. <laughs> Okay, um, there are questions in the chat also. Um, yes, I, I, can, I can open the chat. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay, the, um, so someone, I cannot read the name, oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> Arthur asked um, whether we could use the methodology to evaluate the nine euro ticket experiment. Okay, um, I assume that with the nine euro ticket experiment, you will have such a high occupancy all the time that you will definitely be sustainable <laughs> and that it will not make a difference whether you look on the load or on the occupancy. Um, we have not thought about <laughs> anything into this direction. Um, so public transport is, um, is a different topic because in public transport, you have fixed routes. Usually you also have fixed times when the um, vehicles go. Um, and here the idea is to be more flexible than public transport. So a bit like private cars where you have this perfect flexibility, but also more sustainable than private cars. So something between public transport and private cars. Um, and there's also a lot of research done on ride pooling in combination with public transport. So how both things go together, um, how people choose if you have both, um, whether they um, just combat around the users or how they could maybe just um, yeah, be a good system together. Um, like, I hope that answered the question somehow, but it looks like more joke than <laughs> a real question. Okay, you're welcome. Um, and Kai asks whether the distance in the model can be replaced by expense, emission, or other parameters. Uh, of course, you could replace that distance. Um, this was our idea for a very simple um, observable that somehow measures the emissions and the energy costs. And so um, it should also be proportional to at least the dynamic costs, for example, that users would pay for their ride in the end. Um, so if they travel very far and travel for a long route length, then they will have a higher price, for example. So there are many things that are somehow proportional to this travel distance. That's why many people use the distance um, traveled as a measure, and we also decided for that. So you can, of course, replace it, but uh, we thought that it's most general and 
uh, takes into account like expense emissions and other parameters. Further questions? I think someone raised their hand. Uh, yeah, go, go ahead, Lucas. Yes, hello. Um, first of all, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, first of all, thank you for the great talk. That was very, very nice and comprehensive. I enjoyed that a lot. Um, my question was towards the end, you said that the model you presented here could um, help to make services like Uber and Lyft more sustainable, right? Um, but in the beginning of the talk, you said that the problem was that it attracted pedestrians or people who were taking their bike or public transport um, to the road, which seems like an unrelated problem. So, um, yeah, so I tried to make this talk compre comprehensive and short. <laughs> Thank you for that uh, nice feedback. Um, so I ignored some things on that story and tried to take out my question. Um, so Uber and Lyft and all these services, they um, usually have two forms of service. They have ride sharing and ride pooling. Ride sharing means that you have something like car sharing. You don't have your own car. And in addition, uh, you are not the driver. So someone drives you in their car. That is something like a taxi service, but it is not public taxi, but um, somehow self-organized and with apps and so on. That is often called ride sharing, especially in the USA. And um, a second thing is ride pooling, where you have these sharing services, but you aim to pool the rides, so to have multiple users in a vehicle at once. And um, the basic problem why these congestions occurred um, Oh, oh, these are very many effects, sorry. The basic problem is that the services usually do ride sharing. So they lift and Uber and so on, um, mostly don't pool the rides of multiple users, but they just replace private cars because um, some driver will drive you around. And then they made congestion because um, more people used cars than they would have used before. And because people that don't have an own car go now buy a taxi-like service. Um, so this is like, maybe I was not a hundred percent honest by taking these articles for my motivation, but it fit quite well. So it still raises the same question. Um, but, uh, this is a bit, a different problem. You're right. Um, and the second problem is, uh, if you want to pool rights and you allow for this right pooling, um, then still it can happen depending on how your service works and, um, also, how many users you have, how many buses you have, how you, how for what travel times you aim, um, whether the service is sustainable or not. So you can pool rides um, and really have multiple users in the car and have a high occupancy and still not be sustainable. This is what I have shown you. Um, but here for for uh, like for these news um, articles, it was more about the question whether you share or pool the rights. But it happens still that you really want to pool the rights um, also in pilot projects here in Germany, um, where you uh, allow that uh, multiple users are in the vehicle at the same time. And still you're not sustainable because you do it in the wrong regime. So with the wrong parameters, too many, too many buses. Did that oh, okay. your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. I was not aware of the distinction, but yes, thank you. Yeah, um, I, I skipped that because it makes things much more complicated and um, I did not want to talk too long. So. Fair enough, fair enough. Also a fair question. Another question, follow up or related to this that just came to my mind in terms of parameters for right pooling. Mm, have people investigated the, let's say there are many parameters, I guess, but the vehicles themselves, the capacity, like how many passengers they can carry. Very and good question. Yeah. An optimal, uh, probably depends on the setting. And um, this is also a very good question. Um, so I myself did simulations with capacity and without capacity of the vehicles. Um, but in the things that I've shown you here, I took infinite vehicle capacity, so I ignored capacity restrictions. But just last week, uh, a paper has been published by some co-workers of mine um, who did research on that. Um, so they uh, investigated the influence of the vehicle capacity. Um, and their main finding was that this effectively reduces the number of buses. So if you have um, a bus that is, so uh, if you have vehicle capacity, um, then in a, um, 
equilibrium state where when you don't change the number of uh, users too much, but you have constant demand, um, then the same number of buses will be crowded and full approximately all the time on average. Um, and these buses will effectively be taken out of the algorithm. So they will effectively not be any assigned any requests because they are full. Um, and that makes that the algorithm effectively sees less buses. So this somehow simply reduces the number of buses and the number of buses is already in our load as one of the important parameters. Um, so this is somehow shifts uh, the problem back to the number of buses such that we can say the, um, the capacity is not an important influence, we ignore the capacity, but the number of buses is one of the important influences that we have in our model. So this is somehow how we deal with so many parameters. So it doesn't matter to you. It, it does matter, but, but um, yeah. it can effectively be captured by the number of buses. I see. So if you, and did you have, like, could you have, like, not a constant number of like a constant capacity, but would that also be true if the capacity would differ? So small, medium, large vehicles? Is that something people have looked at? No. So I'm curious. So. Yeah, I don't think if it so. makes sense to have very big vehicles with large capacity. Some big and some small. Or we have some big and some small. What would be kind of a distribution that would be optimal for? Oh, okay. I guess no one ever asked that question. So, okay. uh, so research, yeah. research wise, um, I think. Uh, I have not heard of anyone who did research on that because the, uh, my co-workers who did the research on the effective number of buses um, from the capacity that I've just talked about, um, this is really new, so they just published it last week and they have not done anything on different number of buses. We mostly do mean field approaches, but here this was not even the number, the, the question of asking mean field wise how large will the vehicles be, but the question was more that operators usually have one type of vehicles. Um, so this might be interesting. Um, I, mean, I, I can ask them. In terms of like per car um, um, pooling services like Lyft and Uber, I mean, they're always, they're not buses, right? They're small. Yeah. Um, they fit two, three, four people versus public transport where you have buses. And I'm not sure if the size of the vehicle must somehow affect uh, right, the load on on the network probably. It's an interesting question. I definitely ask my coworkers. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I don't have any idea. I would assume that probably it won't change too much because we take mean field approaches for many things, and if you then um, put some put some distribution um, instead, it usually doesn't change that much. But I don't know. Okay. All right. <laughs> Maybe it's also interesting for the guys who do um, like coupling of ride pooling and public transport, because this would also be some kind of coupling if you have some large buses and smaller ones for the more flexible routes, maybe. Yeah. Interesting question. <laughs> okay. All right, further questions? If not, I have a question. I am, um, so if I understood correctly, one of the most, one of the type of findings is that load parameter can predict whether or not the system would be sustainable. But wouldn't that indicate that I, as a ride pooling service, could just reduce the number of my, like I'll put the number of, of rides I can offer to increase the load? Like if I have few enough buses, then th 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 that works, right? So, so you would react, yeah, because the demand is given somehow. So you can, of course, make some advertisements and hope that you will have more users. but somehow the demand is given from the city that you operate in and the people that want to travel. And then you can decide, okay, I take two buses, uh, then I will fit a lot of users in each vehicle, but I will have a more sustainable route, yeah. Sure, but I mean, like in a real life scenario, that would that would decrease the, the requests I get potentially. Like you, you, you show, you've shown the slide of um, New York City and I think there was between Saturday and Sunday night, there was quite a lot of well, like, Saturday night, there was a lot of requests, probably people going home from going out. Um, and the, the model or the, the, the simulation, the buses had a full load until almost almost the time the next day when people started going to work again. I would assume that if you're in that situation, you would eventually just not request anymore. Um, and I know you said that you're not modeling this, but have people looked into that? Because there seems to be an interplay between requests and 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 load if I just I have looked into that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Do you want to get in, to learn more about my paper? 
it, it seems like okay um so this is the algorithm um uh, oh, oh, oh. so um you know already individual mobility and you know this this is unimportant i just copied the slides from another talk sorry <laughs> You already know the model, that's fine. Okay, and you know this observable. But if uh, another interesting observable is, of course, not how far the users and the cars, the cars and the buses go, but how long it takes for the users. So um, I also measure the travel time. Um, this is the sum of the time that the users wait from their request to their arrival, um, the time that they um, wait, uh, drive from their pickup to their delivery, and the time that they uh, wait. No. And um, later on, I will also look what happens if users walk. That is why in this slide, um, we already have a walk time um, from the request to the actual arrival point and the walk time from the delivery to the arrival point. But uh, this is not what I focus on here. So travel time means uh, time from, from the request that you pose, waiting, driving until you really arrive. And we can, again, um, like uh, put that in relation to the drive time that you would have if you go by a direct car so we always have these i always use these relative quantities to compare it to private tra um, traffic and um, now the we again can have um, many vehicles or few vehicles if we have few vehicles many users are crowded in each vehicle so by the number of vehicles we can um, modify the load or we can really control the load that's why i called it a control parameter um, and if we have many buses for the same number of uh, requests then we will have fewer users in each of the vehicles and we will have less crowded vehicles and a smaller load and um, the relative route length increases with the number of buses because um, here you simply have less overlap of the routes and um, then each of the buses will go short but if you sum it over all of the buses it will be longer in the end and the travel time will reduce so if you have few buses then you have a lot of detour due to all the other co-passengers. And if you have few bus, uh, many buses, then you have few other um, co-travelers, you have few detour and you are faster. And if we glue this together, then we find a trade-off between the relative route length and the relative travel mm -hmm. time. So you can either have a short, um, short relative route length, so you are very sustainable and you save a lot of time, um, but then you are slow, or on the other hand side, you can be fast, but then you're not that sustainable because you have a high relative route length. So this is somehow how these quantities belong together. Um, and now that I've shown you that, I will also show you what happens if people start to walk. <laughs> so I introduced the model for dynamic stop pooling. Um, dynamic stop pooling, now I have to go back um, two slides. This is now a different order than I wanted to have. Dynamic stop pooling means for me not, um, like I want to, in. Uh, let people walk a bit so that we go more into the direction of public transport. So I've told you that on the one hand side, we have um, private cars that are very flexible, but not that sustainable. On the other hand side, we have public transport, which is very sustainable, but not that flexible because we have fixed routes. In the middle, we have ride pooling that is flexible, but also with a higher occupancy, so it's more sustainable. Um, and now I want to see, okay, what happens if we let people walk? So we get probably more sustainable because we can go on routes that are more direct. And um, on the other hand side, we might pay with additional walk times. And I really want to do that flexible. That means I introduce a pool radius that I put around each stop. And then I check for the stop, are there stops inside this radius? And here you have, for example, this stop inside the radius. So the user will not be served door to door wise anymore exactly here, but the user will leave the vehicle here and then walk the rest home. Or, for example, the user will walk to the start. Um, and I, um, users might also be rejected and walk their whole trip if the trip is so short that origin and destination fit both into the circle. This is simply to make the model easier because I had to deal with those users somehow. And if we now let users walk, then we measure the total distance driven and the average travel time. Um, then either users cannot walk at all when the relative pool radius is zero, or when it is one, I rescaled it such that when it is one, users will all walk their complete trip because the pool radius is then so large that the whole space is actually just pool radius and you will just walk your whole trip. So we don't want to have this, of course, but for the sake of complete, completeness, I will still show it to you. Um, and we find that dynamic stop pooling saves stops. So this is the number of um, the, the ratio of stops that is left to the system. 
that was what we expected. That was why we introduced it. Okay, fine. Um, not so important. Um, and what we also find is that the travel time reduces. So um, in the beginning, this uh, short walks of the users reduce the travel time. Um, in the end, it increases again. Um, that is because the additional walk time in the end is so high um, that when everyone walks, uh, travel time will increase again. But in the beginning, the wait and the drive time reduce because um, the users enter the vehicles later and go on routes that are more direct, have less detour due to other users because there are less stops in the system. Um, and this makes um, the travel time, or that this reduces the travel time for small pool ready. This is, we ignore this again. Um, and this is very interesting because that means for the trade-off that we had seen that with different pool ready, the increase in the travel time curve is lower now. So for a higher pool radius, you will not pay with that much travel time. And that means you can now um, break the trade-off Oh, now my computer is overloaded somehow. <laughs> uh, this means you can now break the trade-off. So in case one, without stop pooling, we would have to stay on this curve and we can reduce the number of buses. So let's say, okay, in the beginning we have 45 buses and we have a certain demand in our city and now we want to save road length and be more sustainable. So we simply say, okay, we just take 40 buses just as Len suggested. This is more sustainable, but now users are uh, slower and users might leave the service or take another service. But if we do the same, reduce the number of buses and at the same time let people walk up to 10%, I think in this curve it's 10% of their trip, then they will be faster in the end or at approximately the same velocity, plus we will be more sustainable. So this service is much more attractive. Um, and this is because uh, the pool radius opens a new dimension here in this trade-off plot, but this means that walking can make ride-sharing more sustainable and more attractive, depending on what you choose. Hmm. See, well, but you have to convince users to walk, but that's, 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 that's not you a problem of your research, that's a social problem. Oh, yes. social but, I think, but I think it's easier to co convince them if you tell them that they will be faster afterwards. That's true, that's true. Um, so I will give a science slam at Lange nach der Wissenschaften on Friday evening at uh, 11 o'clock at Hörsaalzentrum at TU Dresden. If you are uh, interested, you are very welcome to come and I will tell you there in 10 minutes why walking can make you faster. You have already heard it right now, but maybe you need it a second time to convince you. And um, I think it's important to tell this to people because um, this can motivate, of course, to, to make people walk. If you know that depending on, this, on the system, it can make everyone faster. So there are actually only benefits. So why shouldn't we walk? <laughs> yeah. I, ho I hope this answered your question. No, 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 this was a really long model um, as an answer no, no, no. to this question. <laughs> Very interesting, thank you. This is what my paper is about. So if you're interested in uh, getting to learn more, you can come to my science lab, or otherwise um, you can read my paper. <laughs> thank you. Further questions in the chat or um, otherwise? If not, then I think I would thank you again for um, presenting here and it was a very interesting talk and thank all of you for attending.